So hello, Martha and Philip. It's so good to have you back again for another video. And this good. week we have a special guest, which is Pastor Justin Johnson from Our Savior Lutheran Church, which is in a town called Corona, I think. That's exactly it, Corona on the Hudson. <laughs> Um, so all the way from Croton on the other side of the county, um, we thought we would try bringing in um, a guest uh, to join us with our sermoning today. Um, since uh, we're able to do this remotely and to bring people in, I thought we should take advantage of that and figure out a way to do that. Thanks for having me. For the third Sunday of Easter, for St. Thomas and St. Paul, this is our sixth joint worship service and even though we are not able to come together to worship in person we're gathered in virtual space and god is with us so this makes it a holy space for us we welcome all who are seeking god's love and grace we welcome all because god welcomes all we encourage young children to participate and make their presence known we come from a wide variety of places in earth and individual spiritual journeys. We are many races and cultures, different sexual orientations, under gender identities and families of various configurations and single people. We are various stages of life, differing abilities and health and economic circumstances. Our unity is in Christ who calls for us to reject division and discrimination. Amen. Let us begin this time together with a prayer of confession and forgiveness. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy Lord, your followers give to your children something more powerful and more valuable than riches. They gave healing and hope. Bring healing and hope into our world and show us evidence of your presence in our lives. Alleluia, alleluia. A reading from the book of Daniel, the third chapter, Deliverance from the Fiery Furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue in the province of Babylon. The king sent for all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication. The herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue. All the peoples fell down and worshiped the golden statue. Certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. 
they said to the king, to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in and said, If you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three that were thrown bound into the fire? They answered the king, true, O king. He replied, but I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire and they are not hurt and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the, father, that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. There is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks, thanks be to God. God. A reading from the book of Acts, the third chapter. After Jesus' ascension and the descending of the Spirit, apostles begin to carry on the ministry of healing and reconciliation. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The good news, according to Mark, the sixth chapter. The colorful story of Jesus' appearance to two disciples on the road to Emmaus answers the question of how Jesus is to be recognized among us. 
Here he is revealed through the scriptures and in the breaking of bread. Now on that same day, when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us, they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe that all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah, the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to him, to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road, and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So we wanted to have a conversation about this Gospel reading. We've got three beautiful readings here, but we're going to focus on the gospel. Um, it's printed as the gospel of Mark, but it's the gospel of Luke. Um, so we're very um, glad to have our guest, Justin Johnson, pastor of our Savior Church. Um, so I wanted to open with us thinking about how, you know, sometimes when we read these stories, we wonder who these people are and what their life was like. Um, but I'm wondering, Martha, if you think about um, these disciples, if you think that there's any way in which we might be able to relate to them and what they're doing and what they're experiencing. I think that this really speaks to us today, certainly the isolation that they felt, the uncertainty about what the future held for them. They are confined in that upper room, that sheltered place. And just as we are right now in a period of isolation, we don't really know what is coming. But for those of us here in New York, we hear a date of May 15th, but in reality, we don't know when our lives will resume. Since we have gone through Easter, but we're still living in a Lenten time, waiting for resurrection. So as we, look at the story of these disciples and how they were feeling their disappointment, the fact that life could not go on as it had been. 
at something that I think we can all relate to at this time. We can enter into this story. Uh, St. Ignatius Loyola teaches us to place ourselves in the gospel. We can enter this story and we can be those two people walking down that road, distant from anyone else and not knowing what will come next. So I think that this is a very powerful passage for us because it ends on a note of hope for us that even when we are in this place in which we find ourselves for an indefinite amount of time, when we cannot come to this community, when we don't know what it may even look like when we're able to gather again, we take our comfort and we have the assurance of the reality that Christ is there walking with us. That even when we gather in virtual space, that becomes holy because Christ is with us. And so we can relate to this passage on numerous levels, knowing that that reality is there, that promise has been fulfilled. No matter what we experience, we are not alone. I've been reading uh, Frederick Buechner's The Magnificent Defeat as preparation for tomorrow. And in my sermon tomorrow, this is the opening example, and it's borrowing heavily from him. I think we could put ourselves into this anytime we've had a funeral in our lives. That moment immediately after, when life was normal at one point, death happens, and then there's this moment immediately after the funeral where the talking has stopped, where the, the uh, chit-chat has, has ended, where the handshaking is done, and you know life has to go on, even though the one that you loved completely and wholly is now gone. And so as the disciples or these apostles are, are walking away, we don't know their relationship to Jesus, whether they were there or not. We, I mean, we know that they were present probably at his crucifixion, but how much of the inner circle they were, we don't know. But we know that disappointment. And we know that feeling of heaviness after being through a giant traumatic experience. One that, that resulted in death. And now this moment that we have to move on from this, trying to piece our lives together after this, after that hope and that expectation. So that's how I see myself in the midst of this, having gone through funerals before, and that just that one moment where that deep breath comes, and it's almost, well, what do we do now? So we read about these people who are experiencing grief, and we think about the way in which we are grieving the life that we had and the freedom that we had, and it really resonates with us. I think this story is meant to tell us something, Justin, about how we connect to Jesus, how we can connect to Jesus. He's not going to walk up next to us on a road, um, but uh, the disciples, he was walking next to them, and they didn't recognize him, but I think it's meant to tell us something about how we can connect to Jesus, how we can expect to do that. You know, if, if you come to my church, you often hear me say that every person that we interact with, every person that we connect with, every person that's standing in front of us should be Jesus to us. Whether uh, we're expecting Jesus at that moment or not, uh, we're trying to find the holy in the person across from us. And so for me, the connection and this is what I've been missing throughout this whole thing as, we, as we've had a pause on communion, is every time I place the bread into somebody's hand and say, this is for you, this is that moment of deep connection between, uh, between me and Christ standing in front of me. And that person is looking at me and saying, here is Christ being present. And so it's this really holy moment in that, in that tiny fraction of a second that we have and so 
that's what I say when we go out into the world, how much are we looking for Christ in the other person? How much are we looking for Jesus on a regular basis? And sometimes our eyes are blind because we can't see Christ in the other person for some unknown reason, but how do we dig? How do we keep finding? How do we find the moments of hope? Justin, I'm glad that you raised the issue of communion because I think back on this time and look at this passage and how Jesus is revealed to them in the breaking of the bread. And, and we don't know. I mean, may, maybe they had seen him uh, breaking bread and sharing it with the multitudes. Maybe they had been at other tables with Jesus. But the thing that uh, I have personally missed the most throughout this time, and that I think our congregations have too, is being able to break bread together. And in the absence of that, I think we, we have found and continue to find other ways in which to recognize the Christ in one another. Uh, we, we recognize it when we gather like this and, and we see Christ present with us. Uh, in our congregation, we see it when we gather you know, for, uh, to do our business together uh, virtually or when we have started gathering on Wednesday evening live Zoom prayer. So it is challenging us to find new ways of, as you said, studying the Christ in each other and to recognize that each one is a child of God, that each one is someone for whom Christ came, someone who has reconciled in Christ to God. That could be challenging sometimes, especially when our thoughts are elsewhere when we think about our differences rather than our commonalities. But just as the two disciples on the road to Emmaus who extended hospitality to Jesus and recognized him in the breaking of the bread, we need to find ways, those experiences where we can recognize each other, new ways of gathering. I think one thing that we don't know, when things return to whatever the new normal looks like, I'd like to think that uh, it might be something next to normal, which is a, a lyric from the musical next to normal, that maybe next to normal will be okay. We still don't know what that might look like when we gather as a community, when we gather for worship. So in some ways, we are learning to recognize and to turn in new ways that will carry us forward in ministry. I think this time will certainly shape us in ministry as well. We did a series uh, on John's gospel two years ago through the narrative lectionary. And I was um, struck by how we don't hear about Jesus getting wet in this baptism. And that when John gets to the last supper, we don't see any bread, we don't see any wine. Um, so there's a way in which John wanted us to focus on Jesus being there for the disciples and serving them. Um, so I think this time when we don't have the elements of bread and wine, um, we might think to ourselves, well, maybe we'll just do it ourselves. You know, I'll just be in my home and I'll have a cracker or I'll have a piece of bread. Um, but it's not really about the element of the bread. It's not really the host. It's not really the wine, the chalice. Um, as important as that is and as essential as that is, it's really about the people gathered around that table, uh, the people breaking that bread and, and sharing it with each other. Um, so I think um, we're supposed to get something about... Um, how we respond to Jesus, how we think about the way in which we live with our neighbors, um, the way in which we welcome each other, the way in which we're inclusive. And uh, I think, Martha, maybe that's kind of what we do as a church. We try to figure out how we are inclusive and how we welcome. And this story kind of talks to me about um, that idea that they meet this stranger on the road and then he's, he's home with them having a meal. I think that that's a level of hospitality that was very common in the Middle East in the first century and perhaps very common in other parts of the world today. I think of visits that our family has made and now it's been almost 20 years since the last time to Cuba and how there there's such a spirit of hospitality that even if you don't know someone all that well, there's no qualms about inviting someone into your home to have a, a little cafecito. Um, we're not used 
a kind of hospitality here where we tend to live isolated lives where we know who our neighbors are on either side of us, but we don't necessarily break bread with our neighbors or extend hospitality to them. So I think that you're right. This is about how we become welcoming, how we become hospitable to one another. And again, you know, I keep thinking that we are, we are living in a time uh, in which the church is being recreated. We did not anticipate this, but uh, as Phyllis Tickle wrote, uh, you know, every 500 years, the church goes through a giant rummage sale, and the last one was at the time of the Reformation. This may be our new Reformation that teaches us new ways of being in relationship with one another and in Christ, because when we are in relationship with Christ, that makes us be in relationship with one another and to extend welcome with inclusiveness to all. I think um, this story has such a simple kind of an ordinary feel to it. They're just walking on the road, they're just sitting at a table, they're just sharing bread and wine, um, that there are so many gospels that give us this idea that we should expect to see Jesus in a miracle. You know, I'm gonna pray and then there's gonna be this astounding supernatural miracle and that's how I know that God is present uh, in my life. Um, but that this is telling us that, you know, you're sitting next to somebody and you're sharing bread and you're sharing wine. And that's where Jesus called us to be. That's what Jesus called us to do. Um, I'm struck by the fact that they're, they're leaving uh, Jerusalem. They're grieving. And they're grieving the loss of Jesus. And even more so, maybe, they're grieving the idea that Jesus was going to do something for them. <laughs> they were looking forward to the redeeming of Israel. And it didn't happen. Um, so there's a way sometimes in which we are expecting something um, like a, a political reformation that they probably wanted their oppressors kind of um, treated the way Pharaoh and his chariots were treated or something. They wanted to see the redemption of Israel and now their hopes are all dashed. They had hoped, they had placed their hope in Jesus and he just died on a cross and now they feel as though, you know, anything that they were, all that they were hoping for is now gone. So that the level of grief is, you know, him dying, him being killed. Um, and also what they thought he was bringing them to and what he, they thought he was going to bring about. Um, so I don't know if any of you want to add anything about how we see God in this world and how maybe this story helps us to see God in this world, um, how we are responding to Jesus. Um, and also maybe, you know, kind of getting back to the idea that um, our lives have been interrupted. And time and again in the scriptures, uh, God interrupts people's lives. So I don't know, Justin, if you wanted to add anything about how, how do we look for God? How do we think we're going to see God? Yeah, there's a lot of concepts in there. Thank you, Jim, for, for adding all those. But it, um, one of my favorite portions of, of Luther's writings is the idea of finding the holiness in the ordinary. And we see that through the scriptures throughout. And I think you said it very well. So many times we're often looking for those big, giant events that happen in, in, our, in, a, in life. And we're saying, oh, that's the only place that God can reside. And Luther's very famous one was uh, when we change infants' diapers. Are we doing it recognizing that this is a holy moment, that we've been given this gift here and now, and that when I change a diaper, I'm to do it in the love and praise of God in the midst of it. And I said, I, I don't have much experience with diaper changing, but I can get into that idea of, Every interaction we have, everything that we're doing, do we see our lives as pure gift? Do we see our lives in such a way that this is a moment that we have and that moment is pure gift? Even if we're in the four squares right now, there is not gonna be a moment like this ever again. There are gonna be moments similar to this, but this here is a holy moment. Churches reaching across from one another to one another and connecting, uh, but also going out into the world and spreading that message. This is really an incredible moment. And uh, we always keep talking about wanting to go back to the normal. I don't actually want to go back to the normal. Uh, not, not that I don't miss my people, but this idea that our messages about hope and faith and grace can expand out beyond our communities is exactly what Christ was telling us to do. And I think we got so caught up in the idea of our own little 
uh, like I call castles, our own little castles with our own moats around them that we can't cross uh, because we might walk on somebody else's property or somebody else's turf. Uh, this is a beautiful moment. And so are we finding Christ in it, uh, even isolated, even scared? Maybe it's that time in the desert that we needed to go out into the world and pro to proclaim God in new ways. So I think it's a, it's a great example of how we look at a Bible story and then we put our lives alongside of it. Um, you know, what we've done this day and how we're experiencing the moment right now. Um, placing the news, the newspaper, the, the news that we're receiving beside it, and then noticing the similarities. Um, and I think, you know, we might want to see Jesus up on the mountaintop transfigured, um, but really what Jesus is pointing to is the cross, uh, the service of washing people's feet. Um, and so we're going to see Jesus in that stranger who walks along the street, and we're going to see Jesus in us when we welcome that stranger in, us when we give bread for somebody um to feed them and to bring them to our table fellowship amen and now philip is going to lead us in our response to this word that we've heard we speak of a god who is one but not in one place a god who is one but also three together let us proclaim our faith in a god who is beyond our understanding but well known to those who call upon their savior. Let us confess our faith using the ancient apostles creed. I believe in God, the father almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. For all the world as we face this virus together, be with those who have lost loved ones and all who struggle with isolation, during this time of cancellations, when we cannot worship together in our space, strengthen our hope. We pray for all healthcare workers and first responders. We pray for all working in essential service jobs, delivery, janitorial, retail, groceries, pharmacies. We pray for all teachers and students, parents and children. We pray for those whose income is interrupted and whose livelihoods are at risk. As we wait alone in our homes, remind us that care for and support, to care for and support each other and those in need, and that that is the ministry that we do in your name. Help us to hear the call to be your church in such a time as this. God of love, hear our prayer. For our nation of many peoples, O oh God, open our eyes when we fall prey to fear and intolerance. Make us mindful of our impact on creation, the climate, and our fellow creatures. God of justice, Hear our prayer. Holy God, bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Paul. Bless our councils and their officers and all of our leaders in all of our congregations. Bless our Lutheran schools, colleges, and nursing homes, preschools. May we each discover how our talents can be used to your glory. God of joy, hear our prayer for peace to ring out in our hearts and in our homes, for mercy and forgiveness to reign in every community, for war to cease and hunger to end. God of hope, hear yeah. our prayer. Create in our hearts a yearning to rest in your promise of eternal and resurrected life. Give us thankful hearts for those who have died, even as we look forward to the hope of new life with you. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. 
O God, receive these prayers and the prayers of our hearts through the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you all. And also with you. And we do peace as this. What, there, there's two words there. Do you remember the two words? Yeah, this is a word, and then this is calm. And those two words together are peace. And then this is with. And you. Greetings to my St. Paul's family. I pray that you are all well, both physically and spiritually. Given the unprecedented situation we face, I wanted to update you on what is happening at St. Paul's regarding our finances. First, although the child care center remains closed, our teachers have been reaching out to their children via Zoom and conducting virtual classes. Tuition was collected in March and many donations from parents were received in April. So our staff was paid in full for both months. For the month of May, we are asking each family with one child to pay $500 and $750 if they have more than one child in the center. Unfortunately, we did not receive any funds from the first phase of the Paycheck Protection Loan Program passed by Congress. Our application is complete and in the queue to be considered again now that Congress has, has released more money. Regarding member offerings, I want to thank those of you that have continued to give during this difficult time. I have gone into the church office each week to record and deposit the offerings received. I realize that this is a very stressful time and that many are facing financial hardships. However, if you are able, St. Paul's would greatly appreciate your continued support. There are many ways of forwarding your offerings. You can simply mail a check to the church office. You can use your bank's online bill pay service. You can use Quick Pay with Zelle. Many banks, for example, Chase and Bank of America, offer Zelle for electronic payments. You enter the payee's name and email and the funds are, and the amount you want to transfer and your bank electronically transfers the funds directly into St. Paul's account. Our name at Chase Bank is St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church and our email is spelch at msn.com, S-P-E-L-C-H at msn.com. You can also use Venmo. Using the Venmo app on your smartphone or iPad, you search St. Paul's Rybrook. Click pay or request, enter the amount and click pay. Venmo then transfers the amount to St. Paul's account. In closing, I want you to know how much I really treasure all of you. You are such a blessing, and I am keeping you all in my prayers. If I can be of any help, please reach out. Stay well, and God's peace be with you all. Let us pray. Good and loving God, we rejoice in the life of Jesus, who came among the poor to bring the riches of your grace. As you have blessed us with your gifts, let them be a blessing for others. With the trees of the field, with all earth and heaven, we offer our praise and thanksgiving to your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, make us bold to address you as our Abba as we pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Did we have any closing thoughts that we wanted to add? I was just thinking that um, usually in our prayers we have a list of names, uh, so we're kind of doing those each in our own way, um, but not jointly. But we might lift up uh, Pastor Marv Hank of St. John's in Mamaroneck, who's been hospitalized. Uh, pray for him and for his family and for his congregation. Did anybody else have any other closing uh, thoughts that they wanted to add? Or I wanted to thank Justin for traveling all the way from Corona, Queens, from, from Croton, from Croton, Westchester, and Martha for traveling all the way from Central Nyack. Um, and Philip for traveling all the way from Portchester, 
uh, to do this together. And this was a holy moment, as uh, Justin said. And anything else to close with? Anything else? So if we can have our benediction from Justin. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me this week. So, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with mercy and grant you peace. Amen. Alleluia. Oh,